Okay, I'm going to call Human Services Finance and Policy to order. Good morning, everyone. We have a full agenda this week. So let's get started. Ms. Hansen, can you please take the roll? Chair Schultz is present. Schultz present. Vice Chair Bonner. Bonner present. Bonner present. Lead Albright. Present. I like your tie, sir. Mm. Representative Bolden. Bolden present. Representative Burkle. Burkle present. Representative Fisher. Fisher present. Thank you. Representative Frederick. Present. Representative Hansen. Present. Representative Keel. Present. Representative Liebling. Present. Representative Muller. Present. Representative Knorr. Present. Representative Novotny. Novotny present. Representative Pearson. Pearson present. Thank you. Representative Pinto. Present. Representative Rasmussen. Rasmussen present. Representative Robbins. Present. Good morning. Representative Sandell. Present. And Representative Schumacher. Schumacher present. The team is all here, Chair Schultz. Excellent. So we do have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. Let's see, Representative Albright, would you like to move the minutes from March 10th? So move, Madam Chair. Okay, Representative Albright moves the minutes from March 10th, 2022. Any corrections to those minutes? Not seeing any hands. Okay, please unmute yourself for a voice vote. All those in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion prevails and the minutes are adopted. Okay, members, the first bill on our agenda is House File 167. Do we have Representative Stevenson? There you are. He's connecting right now. Representative Stevenson, we just uh, started your bill. I apologize. I I'm delayed, Madam Chair. <laughs> That's I, okay. Technical difficulties. You're right on time. Do you have, is there, I see there's an A6 amendment. Would you like us to move that? If you would, please, yes. Okay, I'll move the A6 amendment. Can you briefly tell us what it's about? Yes, uh, Madam Chair. This A6 amendment uh, adds up more detail to how we deal with problem gaming under this bill. As I'll discuss in a minute, uh, we are devoting a, a significant portion of the bill's uh, resources to combating problem gaming, and this uh, fleshes out that section of the bill. Okay, members. Um, so the motion is to re-refer House File 167 um, to the Commerce Committee. Um, and in this bill, we'll be discussing Article 2, Section 6, Subdivision 6 members for, for this committee. So the motion is to, I moved the A6 Amendment to House File 167. Please unmute yourself for a voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion prevails and the A6 amendment is adopted. Okay, Representative Stevenson. So the motion is again to re-refer this bill as amended to the Commerce Committee. Um, do you wanna explain that section of the bill that pertains to this committee? I will do that, uh, Madam Chair. So this is a bill to legalize sports betting. Uh, what we do under this bill is, uh, without talking too much about the other sections of, of the bill is we are legal. We are legalizing both uh, uh, brick and mortar sports betting at tribal casinos and also online mobile sports betting. Uh, the mobile sports betting would have uh, a tax of 10%. And of that 10%, uh, we are devoting 40% uh, to uh, problem gaming. Uh, we need to be honest that problem gaming is uh, real. The vast majority of people who engage in gaming uh, can do so responsibly, but for a small subset, it has significant consequences. Uh, as a prosecutor, that's you know what, what I do when I'm outside the legislature. I have I've run into people who 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 have had great difficulty and done terrible things because of uh, a gambling addiction, and so we are devoting more resources than ever before uh, to this issue uh, through this uh, bill. Um, and we are following the structure that is used uh, it, uh, in uh, other areas for problem gaming for funds generated uh, from other sources uh, and partnering with local experts uh, to make sure uh, that we have sufficient resources and some sufficient uh, controls. 
Uh, we're also asking uh, to, the, to study um, uh, electronic uh, uh, gaming, uh, and particularly with regard to young people uh, who we know are most susceptible to problem gaming. Uh, so that is the portion of the bill that's within the Human Services Committee, uh, and I'm always available to answer questions. Thank you, Representative Stevenson. I have two testifiers, Pat Gibbs. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and affiliation and then proceed with your testimony. Are you with us? There you are. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today related to authorizing and regulating mobile sports wagering in Minnesota. And thank you to Representative Stevenson and Garoppolo for your continued willingness to work with my client and other stakeholders to create a sports wagering structure that works for Minnesota. My name is Pat Gibbs. I'm an attorney with the law firm Bork, Harrington, and Sutcliffe. And it is my pleasure to serve as National Public Policy Counsel for the Sports Betting Alliance, or SBA. The SBA is a trade organization comprised of many of the top operators in the mobile sports wagering industry. DraftKings, FanDuel, Bally's, BetMGM, and Fanatics. And together, our members advocate for a competitive mobile sports wagering in the United States. Although I represent the SBA and state capitals across the country, I am particularly pleased to advocate for bringing this industry to Minnesota, as I grew up in Bloomington, graduated from Jefferson High School and the University of Minnesota, and am a native Minnesotan. When considering the policies and impacts of regulating sports wagering, it is important to recognize that this would not bring a new activity to the state. Studies estimate that 1.1 million Minnesotans place $2.5 billion in illegal sports wagers annually using offshore sites on their phones and computers right now. These offshore sites do not care whether users placing a bet do so responsibly or whether they are extending themselves beyond a point they are comfortable with. These offshore sites do not use the best available technology to ensure their users aren't underage. And these offshore sites do not pay taxes to or cooperate with the state to assure best practices are carried out diligently. Alternatively, operators in the regular, regulated mobile sports wagering markets in the United States take public safety and responsible gaming seriously. We want to provide the excitement of feeling a little extra invested in the outcome of, in the outcome of a game while instituting the guardrails to do so responsibly. Not only is it just the right thing to do, but in a regulated market, the continued use of our license is conditioned upon our strict adherence to responsible gaming and any other provisions put in place by the state. Before I close, I would like to briefly mention just some of the public safety and responsible gaming benefits that come along in a regulated mobile sports wagering market. Regulated operators offer users the ability to limit the time they spend on sports betting apps, set a cap on their daily, weekly, monthly deposit or wager amounts, and exclude themselves completely from engaging in that form of gaming. Regulated operators have dedicated player protection teams to support the monitoring of user accounts for potential problem gaming gambling behavior and language. Regulated operators require all employees to receive responsible gaming training and onboarding and then period, periodically thereafter. Regulated operators work with health and research partners like Harvard Medical School's Cambridge Health Alliance Division on Addiction to inform strategic planning, material development, and advising on evidence-based efforts. Regulated operators provide substantial responsible gaming resources and messaging directly in sports wagering apps such as resources, uh, such resources include links to several self-help toolkits and the National Council on Problem Gambling screening tools. And regulated operators partner with organizations like the National Council on Problem Gambling, the American Gaming Association, the Responsible Gaming Conference, and more to promote the research of these issues and the funding to address them. With a regulated competitive mobile market, Minnesota looks to develop a safer environment for its 1.1 million existing sports bettors to operate within. Not only do regulated operators provide reasonable or responsible gaming services directly, but this bill as proposed designates 40% of the generated tax revenue to a fund to address problem gambling. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you today. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Gibbs. The next testifier I have is Bill Haas from the White Earth Tribal Nation. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and affiliation and proceed with your testimony. Hmm. Let's see if this person is here. I'm not seeing the second testifier. So members will move to questions. Any questions for the author or Mr. Gibbs? Ms. Representative Rasmussen. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, appreciate uh, getting an opportunity to to talk about this bill uh, today, and specifically the you know what is being done to address problem gaming. Uh, one question, Madam Chair, I had for the bill author is you know for this study that we added in the A6 amendment. Uh, you know, it, I think this is, this is a very important thing to look at when we're looking at the gambling motivations, belief of young adult gamblers. And I know Chair Stevenson, uh, uh, you know that I've expressed concerns with this in, in previous committee stops for this bill. Wouldn't, wouldn't it make sense for us to actually uh, see the results of this study before moving forward with legislation like this so that we could actually use the recommendations and findings to shape uh, how this uh, sports betting proposal progresses? Represent Chair Stevenson. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Representative Rasmussen. Uh, I don't think so, uh, because uh, if we, it would be one thing if we uh, could guarantee that no young people would gamble uh, for the, uh, until this study was uh, complete. But we know that across Minnesota, young people are engaging in online sports betting every single day through offshore uh, shady websites and digital workarounds, uh, that there is a robust uh, black market. Uh, Mr. Gibbs, uh, I, I, I'm not sure if he said it in this committee, he certainly said it in other committees. Uh, the full size of the black market uh, in Minnesota is, I mean, in terms of bets actually being made each year right now is over $2 billion. Uh, the important thing to understand about this bill is that it isn't expanding gambling, it's trying to transition from a black market to a legal market. I did just want to add, I'm glad you asked your question, Representative Rasmussen, because it reminded me that you offered an amendment in commerce uh, to move uh, the age from 18 to 21. And at the time I told you I was still working on that issue and that I would revisit it before we got uh, through all the committee process. And I, I mentioned this in an earlier committee today uh, that um, we will be moving the age to 21 and uh, adopting your amendment um, uh, in the, the next full committee stop, which will be in, in uh, judiciary. Uh, so just I will commit to that publicly uh, today. I've already done so earlier, but wanted to let you know that since you had worked on that issue before. Thank you, Chair Stevenson. Representative Rasmussen, follow up. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Representative Stevenson. I'm, I'm glad to hear that we'll be moving the age to uh, 21 in the bill, and so appreciate your consideration and taking a look at that. And I hope, you know, as this bill continues to progress uh, through committees and through the legislative session, that we uh, also look at other protections that could be put in place to uh, mitigate the impacts of uh, problem gambling um, and continue that uh, conversation. So uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for the uh, time today and thank you uh, Chair Stevenson for taking the uh, 21 age amendment. Thank you Representative Rasmussen. Representative Novotny. Thank you Chair Schultz. Uh, for the author, I've uh, heard, heard this bill in other committees and you keep referring to wanting to bring this bill, bring the activities out of the black market into, into the public reg regulated market where it can be taxed and I guess it's more of a comment you can, or it's more of a, a statement you can respond if you want, but is there anything else in the black market that the state could profit on that we should bring forward and legislate? I don't think we need to answer that question unless Chair Stevenson, Thank you, you want to say something. No, I, I do actually, because it isn't to tax it. Uh, in fact, we are keeping the tax rate very, very low, much lower than it is in almost any other state in the country. It's, it has nothing, the state has a $9 billion surplus. This is not about generating revenue. And all the funds that we generate from this go towards uh, related uh, activities. Uh, the, the consumer protections and licensing and regulation, uh, the problem gaming aspect, uh, and then youth sports. Uh, what we are trying to do here is be honest about the impact that this activity has on our society and try and structure it in a way that makes sense both for the consumer and for the state. You know, if you go into a, 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 one of the, our tribal casinos and play blackjack and you, you um, uh, win, you can be very confident that you're gonna get your money. If you place a bet on a shady offshore, off, uh, offshore website, uh, you have no remedy if uh, you're cheated. Uh, and so we can protect our consumers. Uh, those, as Mr. Gibbs testified, uh, those offshore websites don't care about problem gamers and there's no protections in place uh, to deal with the impacts that they have on society. This bill would change that and make sure that the, the, that the, some portion of the profits from this are directed 
towards treating people with uh, 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 gambling problems. Uh, and I could go on from there, but none of this money goes into the general fund. This is not about taxing it. In fact, I'm trying to keep the tax rate as low as we possibly can. No, and whenever there's a negative externality, which there is with gambling, namely addiction and losing significant amount of money, but it's really to address the addiction, that negative externality is why you want to bring in revenue. Representative Novotny? Oh, you're muted. Thank you, Chair, and I appreciate the fact that you recognize the potential problem that we're facing uh, with the large amount to treatment just seems like we're creating a problem that we'll have to fix. And I'll, I'll end with that. Thank you, Chair. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Chair Stevenson. Um, so I didn't see the tax rate in there. You keep saying the tax rate will be low. Could you speak to what it actually will be? Very briefly, Chair Stevenson, because we really want to just um, keep our questions to the Article 2, Section 6. Chair Sorry. Stevenson? Yeah, it will be 10% uh, of net revenue, revenue after expenses. Uh, and um, the bill is going to be in the tax committee. I think you're on that committee, Representative Robbins, if I'm correct. So we'll have a full accounting of it there. Thank you, Chair Stevenson. Representative Robbins, any other questions? Um, you know, they'll be more related to tax committee, so I'll just move on. Thank you. Chair Liebling. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And just really briefly, and thank you, Representative Stevenson, for tackling this really difficult issue. I am really somebody who doesn't gamble, really think gambling's problematic and all of that. You know, I mean, if I could wave a wand and say, you know, maybe we should have no gambling in the world, I may do that. I might do that, but that's not where we are. As you say, there is gambling. This is, it is a highly addictive activity for many people and really problematic. And so I think it is very appropriate to do what you're doing and try to regulate it. And um, I just wanted to point out that in, uh, just because of Representative Novotny's question and concern, and you know, I get it, but you know, in our Minnesota constitution, article one, bill of rights, section one, object of government, Government is instituted for the security, benefit, and protection of the people. And, I, you know, externalities, yes. I mean, I think this is very appropriate for us to do. That's, that's all I want to say. I, I appreciate it from somebody coming from, you know, the point of view where I come from. And, and I know a lot of people have heartburn over the state getting involved in, you know, regulating. and all, But we got to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Liebling. I'm not seeing any other questions. Final comments, Chair Stevenson. Uh, I appreciate the good uh, discussion today. Uh, I always say the bill is a work in progress with multiple committee stops ahead of us. And uh, I'm happy to talk to any members uh, at any time and take suggestions. This is a bipartisan bill. So Representative Robbins, if you want to talk about the tax issues, even before tax committee, very happy to talk to you about that. Thank you, Chair Stevenson. With that, members, I'm going to Renew my motion to re-refer House File 167 as amended to the Commerce Committee. So this will be a roll call vote, members. Chair votes aye. Schultz, aye. Vice Chair Bonner? Aye. Bonner, aye. Lead Albright? Aye. Albright, aye. Representative Bolden? Representative Burkle? Burkle, aye. Burkle, aye. Representative Fisher? Fisher, aye. Fisher, aye. Representative Frederick? Aye. Frederick, aye. Representative Hansen? Aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Keel? No. Keel, no. Representative Liebling? Aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Moeller? Aye. Moeller, aye. Representative Noor? No, aye. Noor, aye. Representative Novotny? Novotny, no. Novotny, no. Representative Pearson? Pearson, no. Pearson, no. Representative Pinto? Aye. Pinto, aye. Representative Rasmussen? Rasmussen, no. Rasmussen, no. Representative Robbins? No. Robbins, no. Representative Sandell? Aye. Sandell, aye. Representative Schumacher? Schumacher, no. Schumacher, no. And Representative Bolden? Bolden, aye. Well, then I thank you. Chair Schultz, that's 13 ayes 
and six no's. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. So the motion prevails in House File 167 as amended will re be referred to the Commerce Committee. Okay, members, I'm gonna hand over the gavel to Vice Chair Bonner and present my next two bills. Thank you, Chair Schultz. Um, and with that, we have up next on the schedule today, members, House File 365 before us. Uh, Chair Schultz, would you like to briefly describe the A1 amendment and move to adopt it for your bill? Sure, members, House File 4065 is just a recodification bill in long-term care. And A the A1 is simply a technical amended amendment, so I'd like to move to adopt the A1 amendment. All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, the motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Um, next, uh, I'd like to make the motion to place House File 4065 as amended and recommended on the general register. Um, uh, Chair Schultz, would you like to explain your bill? So members, this is a, a bill we requested uh, that the reviser of statutes work on this language. They have done so, um, nonpartisan staff. I'd like to thank them for working on this. Um, Article one includes long-term care consultation services recodification, conforming changes to other statutes appear in article two. And the reason to do recodification is to better organize the statute without making any policy or fiscal changes. So it just makes the statute much easier to read and to revise if there's um, additional bills coming forward this year. So I hope everyone can um, move it to the general register and we can get this taken care of. Thank you, Chair. All right. And do we, it looks like we do not have any testifiers, uh, but we do have house research here for questions, if we have any. Uh, do we have any member questions for Chair Schultz? Well, Chair Schultz, it must be a good day. I see no questions uh, anywhere in the body. So with that, um, Chair Schultz, would you like to make any closing remarks? I don't think it's necessary, Chair Bonner. All right. Perfect. Then Chair Schultz would like to renew her motion to place House File 4065 as amended and recommended on the general register. Um, and with that, we will have a roll call vote to move that to the general register. Perfect. Chair Schultz. Schultz votes aye. Schultz aye. Vice Chair Bonner. Bonner votes aye. Bonner aye. Lead Albright. Aye. Albright, aye. Representative Bolden. Bolden, aye. Bolden, aye. Representative Burkle. Burkle, aye. Burkle, aye. Representative Fisher. Fisher, aye. Fisher, aye. Representative Frederick. Aye. Frederick, aye. Representative Hansen. Aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Keel. Aye. Keel, aye. Representative Liebling. Liebling, aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Muller. Aye. Muller, aye. Representative Noor. Nor I. Nor I. Representative Novotny? Novotny, I. Novotny, I. Representative Pearson? Pearson, I. Pearson, I. Representative Pinto? I. Pinto, I. Representative Rasmussen? Rasmussen, I. Rasmussen, I. Representative Robbins? I. Robbins, I. Representative Sandel? I. Sandel, I. Representative Schumacher? Schumacher, I. All right, members, look at you go. 19 ayes, zero nays. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. The motion prevails and House File 4065 is on its way to the general register as amended and recommended. Uh, and next we have House File 3698 before us. Uh, Chair Schultz, would you like to make a motion to refer House File 3698 to the Capital Investment Committee? Yeah, I'll move to re-refer House File 3698 to Capital Investment. Perfect. Um, and with that, we have the bill before us. Chair Schultz, would you like to tell us about your bill? Sure. Members, House File 3698 is a bill to appropriate 
$2 million from the general fund for um, a new space for First Witness Child Advocacy Center in Duluth. This center uh, has a collaborative team of professionals, including law enforcement, social workers, doctors, therapists, advocates, prosecutors, and public defenders. And this team, they work together to investigate child abuse and coordinate needed services. Um, it's a nonprofit agency offering hope, healing, and justice for alleged victims of child abuse and their families. Um, it was conceived 30 years ago, and they've significant in significantly increased the number of children they serve. They served 70 children 10 years ago. Last year, they served 230 children, providing child-friendly, legally defensible forensic interviews, intensive ongoing advocacy, mental health services, and medical exams. So I'm going to turn it over to my first testifier. Uh, thank you. It looks like we have a Ms. Tracy Klana here. Yes. Uh, Ms. Klana, if you'd like to state your name and go ahead and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for, for letting me be here this morning. My name is Tracy Klana, and I am the Executive Director of First Witness Child Advocacy Center. As Chair Schultz mentioned, this is a bill about funds for the purchase and renovation of a larger building for our center. According to the CDC, one in seven girls one in 13 boys and one in four non-binary youth in the U.S. will be sexually abused before the age of 18. 30 years ago, our center was built to serve as a place for child-friendly forensic interviews performed by a multidisciplinary team of law enforcement, social services, and prosecuting attorneys. As you can see in our summary, our impact continues to grow and climb both in numbers and in services. First Witness sees our role in disrupting the cycle of violence and building safety both on the individual and the community level. Our team of professionally trained forensic interviewers protect child victims with safe evidence-based techniques. Our family advocates build connections across systems to represent families' needs. Our prevention educators spend time in classrooms empowering children around safety strategies and freedom from self-blame. They train teachers and parents both on prevention and response. This increase has led us to desperately need a new and much larger building. This new building would include child and teen center spaces, space for ongoing advocacy, a medical exam room, a mental health office, an additional forensic interview room, a multidisciplinary team space that allows for law enforcement and social services to truly respond to the needs of these difficult cases. And finally, a training center that will bring investigators and advocates from around the state and around the country to learn from our national model. The course of child abuse investigation is challenging to navigate. To address this, we offer a comprehensive and holistic child advocacy center that provides effective prevention, intervention, and systems change. Thank you for your consideration of this bill. And after Attorney Holitz, I am happy to, to take any questions you have. Uh, Attorney Holitz? Thank you, Ms. Glana. And thank you for the hard work that you continue to do for our community. And with that, our next testifier up, uh, we have uh, Mr. Holitz. If you'd like to state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is John Holitz. Um, I'm an assistant St. Louis County attorney. I'm a, a prosecutor. So thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to speak with you all here, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, as you've heard from, from Tracy already, Ms. Klon already, um, our little space, our first witness child advocacy, advocacy center that we love so much, does so much for so many. Uh, she's already told you about all that it does for so many. We routinely work on behalf of uh, residents of the St. Uh, Louis County, Lake County, Cook, Carl, uh, Cook County, Carlton County, the whole Arrowhead, uh, and more. Uh, inter we do interviews uh, from people all, all around that, that need it uh, as the kids need it. We routinely work with children and their families who are involved in child protection cases, who witness domestic violence, physical violence, 
and who are victims of sexual assault. And that's really my area of, of focus. And so that's what I'd like to speak, speak briefly with you about today is the challenges of the uh, prosecution of child sexual assault and the role that uh, uh, Child Advocacy Center uh, has in that. Uh, uh, Ms. Klana asked me to speak a little bit about authority though, because in order to talk about uh, why we need a new building and why it can't just be any building, uh, we gotta talk a little bit about authority and the difficulty that authority presents when you have a victim or a witness to a crime uh, and particularly when it's a devastating crime, and particularly where the uh, witness or the victim is a child. Testifying in court or testifying here can be intimidating, of course. Uh, and courts, courts are built with a long history of authority and reverence for laws and keeping people in line and making sure that we do things uh, correctly. Uh, and, but that very practice of maintaining this order um, that makes it intimidating for kids. It makes it hard for kids to come in. But first witness, Child Advocacy Center, we help to neutralize that as much as can be done. We can't do it without them. Prosecutors can't do it without them. First, Tracy, uh, Ms. Clana mentioned advocacy. I just wanna say that our advocates, they literally hold the children's hand right up to that stand, getting on that big stand in that big room where it's intimidating to be. They literally and figuratively hold the hands of the families through the process, through this court process that's all about the rights of a defendant and almost never is about the rights of a victim. They dry the tears of children. They're with us in this prosecution uh, all the way, right from the beginning uh, to the end. To do that, as you've heard, uh, the need has increased so greatly. To do that, to keep doing it, our space isn't big enough to even have the advocates meeting in a, in a space that's friendly for children. We need space. We need space for families to heal. The other uh, big big part that <clears throat> uh, First Witness does uh, for me in my role, uh, forensic interviewing, and you've heard a little bit about that from Ms. Klan already too, but forensic interviewing, uh, we do it for all those jurisdictions uh, routinely that, that, uh, we, that I mentioned already. We do that routinely for them. There's these interviews that are based on protocol and research that can be used in court when that child is scared and has difficulty. Uh, we need, we've got a greater need for, for interviewing space. We do that at a much higher frequency as you've, you've heard. We need space to do that too. We need a second to interview space. But the, the building, the building can't just be any space. It's gotta be a, case, a space, back to that idea of authority. It's gotta be a space that's authority reducing. It's gotta be a space that's friendly for children, friendly for their families. We can't be doing this in a police station because of the authority of a police station. We can't be doing this in a government services center because it's a big old government building and that's intimidating to children. It can't be in a prosecutor's office and it sure can't be in a, a courtroom because those spaces are meant for reverence of law and authority. We've gotta be authority reducing. It's gotta be in a child advocacy center and ours is just too small. We need a child friendly space to work with children. We need a space to keep doing what we've been doing for so long. We just need more room. So on behalf of the St. Louis County multidisciplinary team and everybody else in those jurisdictions who really relies on this uh, for such an important issue as child abuse, child sexual assault. We need more space and we need some, we need some help securing some money to, to make sure we've got enough space that we can keep holding offenders accountable and helping families. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Mr. Hollitz. And Certainly, it's very distressing to hear about um, children in this situation, um, but good to know that we have advocates that are out there actively putting the needs of those children first. And so thank you for that. Uh, with that, we do have two members here that have questions. Uh, Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and to uh, Chair Schultz or to the testifiers, um, I understand that this is being re-referred to capital investment, so I won't uh, uh, delay in, in, in getting to the point in terms of, of the point for it being here. Uh, Mr. Hollis, thank you for your work and, and to Ms. Klenoff for your efforts over the many years with this organization. I'm just curious if you could break down in terms of uh, the two million uh, that is being requested in this bill, what that would be utilized for, uh, for the various uh, functions that you provide to these, uh, these children. And who 
would do like you want to take that representative Schultz? I think uh, the um, Ms. Klana can take that. Perfect. Yeah. All right, we'll refer that to Ms. Klana. Sure. Um, so we have identified a space uh, for our our new center. And so a piece of that $2 million is the purchase of that new space. And then what we have recognized as a board is that we need to uh, renovate and provide um, uh, that space in a manner that is going to be good for the next couple of decades, just like this space that we have had has been. And so the renovation of that new space is extensive um, to the tune of about $1.5 million. We can't go into that space knowing that there's going to be things that are needed in that space you know, five years down the road because we can't interrupt our services for that renovation. And so we have worked with architects to um, design that space that is going to be uh, work for us for a long time. And so the investment of $2 million represents a child advocacy center that will be uh, meet the needs of children uh, well into um, two to three decades. And I can certainly forward uh, the budget if that's if you want that level of detail. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Klana. Uh, Representative Albright, did you have any follow up? No, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Representative Novotny. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representative Schultz, for bringing this bill forward. And uh, to the first witness, uh, Ms. Klan, um, thank you for being involved in this program as a graduate of the forensic examiner training that was uh, conducted at your facilities. I can attest that uh, you need parking, you need more space. Um, you know, the facility is very user friendly, but cramped. Um, we had uh, one training where we had to stop because uh, there were too many clients coming in and they needed room. Um, so that is an issue. The program overall, uh, it was the most heartbreaking and yet rewarding and uh, training that uh, I probably went to as an investigator. So please keep up the good work and uh, I'll be a yes. I appreciate your work. Thank you, Representative Novotny. Do we have any other discussion on the bill? Seeing none, uh, Chair Schultz, would you like to give some closing comments? Yes, thank you, Chair Bonner. So this is a really, really important for our region in Minnesota. And, you know, we're at Duluth is very, is known for its DAIP model um, across the country. And um, as you've already heard, there's not enough privacy to um, care for all of their clients at their current facility. So this is a, it's a priority for, for Northern Minnesota. So I hope all of you can support the bill. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chair Schultz. And with that, Chair Schultz renews her motion to refer House File 3698 to the Capital Investments Committee. Uh, Ms. Hansen, would you please take the roll? Sure. Chair Schultz? Hi. Schultz, aye. Vice Chair Bonner. Bonner, aye. Bonner, aye. Lead Albright. Albright, aye. Albright, aye. Representative Bolden. Bolden, aye. Bolden, aye. Representative Burkle. Burkle, aye. Burkle, aye. Representative Fisher. Fisher, aye. Fisher, aye. Representative Frederick. Aye. Frederick, aye. Representative Hansen. Aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Keel. Keel, aye. Thank you. Keel, aye. Representative Liebling. Liebling, aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Muller. Aye. Muller, aye. Representative Moore. No, aye. Nor, aye. Representative Novotny. Novotny, aye. Novotny, aye. Representative Pearson. Pearson, aye. Pearson, aye. Representative Pinto. Aye. Pinto, aye. Representative Rasmussen. Rasmussen, aye. Rasmussen, aye. Representative Robbins. Aye. Robbins, aye. Representative Sandell. Aye. Sandell, aye. Representative Schumacher. We'll excuse Representative Schumacher for this one. Members, that's 18 ayes and one excused. Wonderful.
All right, thank you, Ms. Hansen. And uh, Madam Chair, you are knocking it out of the park today. Uh, so with that, the motion prevails and House File 3698 has been referred to the Capital Investment Committee. And with that, uh, before I think we you miss maybe misstated the file house file number, Chair Bonner. Uh, 2698. My apologies. Um, the house file is it 3698, correct? Yes, correct. Yep. Am I in my notes? Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. I misspoke. No, you're uh, right. Sorry, I have the wrong number down on my paper. Okay, <laughs> I just want to make sure we cross <laughs> the T's and dot the I's. Uh, so just to restate for the record, the motion prevails. House file 3698 has been referred to the Capital Investment Committee. Uh, and before we move on, I will return the gavel uh, to Chair Schultz. Thank you for chairing, um, Representative Bonner. Okay, the next item on our agenda is House file 3211. This is Representative Pinto's bill. I see that you have an A22 amendment. You want to quickly tell us about the amendment and then I'll have you move it. Uh, certainly, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, the bill relates to a, 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 a trust that set up a DHS working with the counties and the amendment is something that was brought to uh, to me by um, uh, by counties to fix some some technical aspects uh, of the bill. So I'd ask if we can add that now. I think we'll have during discussion, I suspect we'll identify some more technical aspects, but this will this will move in the right direction. Okay, so Representative Pinto moves the A22 amendment. Please unmute yourself for a voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion prevails and the A22 amendment is adopted. Representative Pinto, do you wanna to move to lay this bill over for possible inclusion in our human services omnibus bill? That is correct. Yeah, Madam Chair, uh, that is my motion. Okay, Representative Pinto moves to lay House File 3211 as amended over for possible inclusion in Human Services Omnibus Bill. To your bill as amended, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. Uh, so the bill uh, before you, 3211, would establish a trust uh, for the Social Security benefits uh, uh, that are received by uh, children in foster care. Uh, we'll discuss some of the technical aspects of setting that up, but to understand the context of that, uh, members, um, uh, children who exit foster care, uh, I hope that this committee would be well aware, um, are an extremely challenging situation. If you think about uh, when, uh, when you were 21, I think many of the members of this committee would have received a lot of support from their families at age 21, and maybe even 22, 23, 24, 25, and quite a few years after that. Um, it is no surprise that a young person who exits foster care at 21 and is on their own uh, is uh, at very high risk of uh, homelessness and instability. And I think estimates are as many as 40% of the young people who were under our care before age 21 then experience homelessness after that age. Um, so we might think to ourselves, well, boy, it'd be great if there was a source of funding uh, that was available to young people. Uh, and in fact, for some, there is tragically uh, often on the death of a parent they uh, are entitled to social security benefits. But under current law, those benefits go to pay for their care while they're in foster care. So by the time they get to age 21, those benefits have then been spent. Um, that strikes me as an injustice and I hope it would strike all of you as that as well. Um, so what the bill does is sets up a trust to receive the benefits, to hold them, and then pay them out at age 21. I want to say candidly, members, at the start of this conversation, that um, there are still some details to work out regarding making that mechanism work. I suspect we'll talk about that in the discussion, and there'll be ongoing conversations. Again, the plan is to lay this bill over. Um, but uh, at the very least, I want to make sure we recognize the injustice of that, and, and, and we're trying to move forward on it. So, Madam Chair, I do have two testifiers to share a little more on this issue. Okay, thank you, Representative Pinto. The first testifier I have is Antonia Luna Jackson. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and affiliation and then proceed with your testimony. Hi, um, my name is Anthony Jackson, but I go by Antonio or AJ. Um, chair and members of the committee, thank you for giving me the chance to speak before you today. I currently live in St. Paul, but I have lived almost everywhere in the Twin Cities. I've also lived in Bloomington. I am a senior at Kennedy High School um, in Bloomington, and I'm, take, I'm looking forward to graduating this spring. My passion is theater and cinematography, but you'll hear a lot about this because acting, singing, and dancing is where I found my refuge in my life. Um, I am a foster care kid at the moment. I'm 17 years old. 
Um, next fall, I will be either attending the University of Minnesota or Concordia, Moorhead for Performing Arts. Um, I'm excited for what my future holds. I'm doing well for myself now, but to say the least, it hasn't been easy. My mom and my stepdad and my siblings struggled to find a place to live um, before my mom passed away in 2016. It only got worse after that, though, for me. Um, I had to grow up pretty quick because everyone in my close family had a place to go to with their friends or with their, you know, favorite aunties, but I really didn't. Um, I was 12. And I did the best that I could to survive. And I bounced around from home to home with extended family and friends before I officially entered foster care at the age of 15. It turns out home is still temporary in foster care. Um, getting into foster care was weird and hard to me because there was always decisions being made without my like inclusiveness. I never was included. And I, I can tell you that I didn't really care, but I did. I just, I felt powerless. I didn't think I could say anything. Whenever I did, I got shut down. You know, they played the adult card. Um, I never had the resources to dream for anything at the time. I didn't know where to go and who to talk to in order to pursue what I wanted to do. Um, but one thing that did work out for me is when I started at a new school in uh, Minneapolis, um, I connected with their counselor and I was feeling so lucky because I found the one in a million therapist. Um, and he actually listened to me and pushed me to challenge myself to pursue my dream and get me out of my comfort zone and social anxiety to talk to people and, you know, pursue my dream. And I, I knew what I wanted to do, but I didn't know how to make it happen. The thing about foster care is that it makes you pretty tough. And the only way to make it out of foster care okay is to be stubborn about my future. And I hate being stubborn because I hate stubborn people, but had to become one in order to make things happen in my life. Despite all of that, I never thought that the system that was supposed to be helping me really was stealing from me. The entire time I found out, um, the entire time I found out about a year ago, um, my friend's mother actually has nephews who receive um, survivor benefits and they're not in foster care, um, but they still receive the benefits because they have a deceased parent. And they assumed that I had it and they could see that I was struggling and such. So, I was doubtful about it, but I thought it couldn't help. It couldn't hurt to ask my social worker team to see if I was eligible for this or if I had it. Because at the time, I was actually planning to go to college in Georgia. So I was like, you know, you know, this would help me very much because Georgia schools are expensive. Reasons why I'm not going currently. Um, but at the time, I was planning on doing it. Um, so I asked my social worker to, like, you know, give me information on the, the subject. And she was just, you know, putting me down and saying like, you know, she was avoiding the questions and better statement. I was persistent and advocated for some answers. After a while, my social worker confirmed that there were survivor benefits being paid out. However, she said that I could not touch this money, that it is not mine to use or have. And I was told that it was the state's money. I quote, she said, and it said, um, and it was paying for my foster care placement. Another quote, she said that. And I was confused about that um, because I don't know why I would be paying for my own placement. I don't think that's how that works. But I was left putting together all the pieces of the puzzle. My social worker continued to tell me to let it go and that there was nothing I can do about it. I couldn't take no for an answer, honestly, because I, t I exhaust my resources, especially when it comes to my future. And this seemed so wrong to me. It didn't really make any sense. And I had so many questions, which no one seemed to have the answer for. Why was I being made to pay for foster care? Does every kid who loses a parent have to pay for their own foster care? I wonder that. I do have friends in the foster care system. And, you know, I wonder if they know about this, you know, because this will really help them too. I know that I'm 17 and I'm still technically a kid, but this doesn't mean I don't have a voice because I felt like that for the past years up until, you know, recently when I felt like I could talk and speak up now and be included in the conversations about my life. You know, I'm not gonna be silent about the injustices that are going on. I know I'm alone and I will be when I turn 18 in April, but my life is hard enough and I wasn't going to stop fighting to make it easier. Luckily, I didn't have to go to court alone. I had an attorney appointed to my case I entered, when I entered foster care. So I reached out to Emmett, my attorney, and asked him to help me bring this subject up in the next hearing 
Unfortunately, the message continued to be the same. Maybe you'll get it when you turn 18. I, the thing about survivor benefits is I'm pretty sure you were no longer eligible to receive those when you turn 18 because apparently my brothers are getting it, but you know, they stopped getting it until they turned 18 a while, a while ago. The money is gone and the county may have spent it by the time I'm 18. We didn't give up, however. I had heard about this organization that worked with fosters to do advocacy. He connected me with foster advocates and turns out they were already working on this and were going to help me, hence why I'm here. We did the math. I learned that I've had an estimate of $22,000 taken away from me because my foster team, my social worker team told me that now that I've brought this subject up, they're going to get, they're going to, you know, save $350 from that payment that they're receiving a month starting December 1st. I never really got any valid confirmation about that. But with that $350, we backtracked it and did the, est um, the estimate and the math um, from when I entered foster care. And it's $22,000. And that's a lot of money that I could have used and it could have changed my life, honestly. And I know my mom wouldn't want me to struggle, you know, when she passed away and such. So I, I know she wouldn't want it to be this difficult. And it has taken so much to get to this point. I wouldn't have been here if it wasn't for my friends telling me about that, you know, money that I could have had. And if I hadn't reached out to an attorney and if I hadn't met foster advocates, I would have never known that this support ever was even available to me and would have never known at all. How could I have known, honestly, because my social workers never even said anything about social security, actually. It was wrong to take this money from me and the kids like me. I support this law because it is the right thing to do. and We should not be forcing children to pay for their own care. On April 8th, I will finally be 18, something I've wanted for a long time. I hope I'm able to have a stable place to live. Um, I hope I go to college in the fall. I really want to. I really want to pursue my dreams. And although I will finally be free to live my life to pursue college and performing arts and hopefully one day be an actor, I worry about the cost because it's not cheap to be an actor, especially a startup one. And I struggle. I still struggle with the pain and hurt when I think about the fact that I didn't, it didn't have to be this way. It didn't need to be so hard. I know it is too late for me to get this resource, but it isn't too late for all the other kids still in the system and the kids that will be entering the system. Minnesota has the opportunity to do the right thing by the fosters and all the kids who enter this program. Please vote yes in support of HF3211. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Thank you for being a strong advocate for this and for being persistent and not giving up. And we have a really great theater program at the University of Minnesota Duluth. So contact me if you want to learn more about it. Um, we can help try to help you make that happen. Um, the next testifier I have is um, Wong Murphy. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and affiliation and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Uh, Juan Murphy and I'm with Foster Ad Advocates. Good morning, Chair Schultz and members of the committee. It is an honor to be testifying before you this morning. My name is Huang, and I'm the founder and executive director of a, of a nonprofit called Foster Advocates. It is our name, but it is also what we do. We foster advocacy with young people who have been impacted by foster care. One of my earliest memories uh, is from when I was five or maybe six, I'm not sure, because it's hard to know your age when you've never cel celebrated a birthday before. And when all you know are the walls of a apartment, there isn't much to mark the passing of time. What I do remember is sitting on a deck wrapped in a blanket because I was forced to sleep outside for the crime of asking for food the night before. I was wearing the only shirt I recall ever owning. It was a four screen sweatshirt. And it was practically a V-neck from where I had chewed it. A doctor would later tell me that this is a common behavior to relieve hunger. But luckily I went to school when I was eight. This experience quite literally saved my life. A teacher saw that I was a kid that was in danger and triggered the systems in place to protect kids like me. Two days later, my brother and I entered foster care. We survived. 
And I wish that I could say that foster care continued to be my and my siblings' salvation. But when we turned 18 and graduated high school, I was lucky enough to be able to go off to college. Our brother uh, turned 18 and was going to stay in his foster home while he figured out his next steps. Unfortunately, uh, you know, he has pretty severe disabilities uh, and was unable to uh, find stable employment. Uh, his foster family asked him to leave their home uh, after they realized they were no longer getting uh, foster care payments. By December, he was sleeping in a car uh, and he was by himself. He has struggled with homelessness ever since. I haven't heard from him in a few months and I can only hope that he is okay. He deserved support 10 years ago. It didn't have to turn out this way. He could have left care with funds to help him transition to his life on his own. But the county spent those funds. So, if, but for too long, we framed the idea that children's welfare is simply about protecting kids. And as a result, we do very little to help them uh, live their lives in any meaningful way. What is the purpose of saving a kid? if you will not ensure that they are loved and that they're going to be cared for. When we were separated from our family, we were made a promise that we would have a better life than if we had stayed. Unfortunately, what I was never told and what the state never tells its young people is that this promise has an expiration. When we turn 18 and we exit foster care, the state no longer keeps track of our successes, our struggles, so at what point do families stop caring for their kids? I'm told that parents, at least the good ones, care for their children well into adulthood. If this is the expectation for the role of a family in a child's life, then the state is a wolf, woefully inadequate replacement. Parents do not make their children raise themselves, nor do they make them pay for their own survival. Children in foster care Many of them are owed social security benefits. However, this money was taken to pay for foster care, which foster youth are not supposed to have to pay for. The state broke its fiduciary duty to its children by spending the money in its best interest, not the child's. So why is this acceptable for foster youth when it, when it would not be acceptable for your own kids? And is the idea that fosters are someone else's kids and therefore do not matter or somehow matter less we have failed to show that we care about our most vulnerable children and the consequences of this indifference is staggering. These are our children and they became ours when we separated them from their families. We owe them a duty of care just as strongly as we do for the children in our own homes. Because the fundamental truth is, is that, ch is that children are children and they should have an expectation that adults will take care of them. But I've repeatedly seen at the personal level and at the systems level, that this is not happening. So is my sincerest hope that those of you in power uh, who are in a position to uh, change this, uh, reflect deeply on our moral responsibility and the cost of our continued indifference to our most vulnerable children. I am asking you to support 3211, to make sure that we leave young people uh, with something to live their lives with at, eight, at 18. So as AJ said, uh, and I hope he's wrong, that it's not too late for him, but it is too late for my brother. And it doesn't have to be this way. So let's make sure it's not true for every other kid that's coming through the system now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. And thank you for all the work you're doing and for sharing your story with us today. The last testifier I have is Brad Vold. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and affiliation and then proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Madam, 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 Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Brad Vold, and I'm the Health and Human Services Director for Morrison County. We appreciate the opportunity to speak on Max's behalf today to address the role of counties playing in administering Social Security and disability benefits and important factors to consider when addressing a House File 3211. I am a member of MAXA. It is a county organization that represents all 87 counties, 300 human service directors, supervisors, and administrators. Counties recognize the importance of ensuring youth who've experienced care or are transitioning from care have access to financial supports. 
Having access to supports has demonstrated benefits such as increased stability in housing, education, and transportation. We thank foster advocates and safe passage, passages for bringing this legislation forward, along with Representative Pinto for his leadership on the issue. MAXA has been engaged throughout the process of considering the highly technical facets of this important issue. By federal law, children in foster care may be eligible for a monthly cash benefit from the Social Security Administration due to either their own disability or based on the retirement, disability, or death of a parent. For children with qualifying disabilities, these Social Security benefits are paid under the SSI program. Children with retired, disabled, or deceased parents with qualifying work records may receive benefits under the Social Security benefits. Estimates have that approximately 5 to 10 percent of youth in foster care are eligible for Social Security and both populations would be addressed under House File 3211. Upon determining eligibility, the Social Security Administration also determines a representative payee, which may be the foster parent, a relative, or in most, case, most cases, the child welfare agency. A number of children eligible for Social Security may also be accessing mental health, the mental health system through a waiver into their adult life. In Minnesota, when a youth enters care, the responsibility for determining and seeking the benefits is fulfilled by counties. We may be responsible for accessing or assessing the eligibility for the youth, making a determination of how the eligibility will impact other funding, such as Title IV-E, and fulfilling the administrative representative payee requirements. The county dedicates the benefit, the costs associated with care of the youth, including food, clothing, shelter, medical care, personal comfort items, or educational costs. If the child is reunified with their family, the benefits follow the child. If the child remains in care, the benefits continue to be administered by the county or the designated representative. If the child is returned to their parents or another caregiver, what happens to the trust and is it transferred to the parent or caregiver or held until the child turns 18? In considering this legislation, we ask you to consider the following. Dedicating this funding to a trust for the youth to use at later dates will divert approximately $6 million from the cost of care. This figure is based on a survey conducted within MAXA and is likely conservative due to, it, due to uh, factors during the pandemic and inconsistent, re inconsistent reporting methods. It may require the county staff determine eligibility for each child if they are not already on social security or disability. And this could be an administrative burden to some counties who may not access this level of funding. Counties would consider SSI or RSDI funds being directed to a trust. And if, if an equal amount of funding is directed to make counties whole and not compromise the care of youth, the role of administering the funds in a trust is centralized at the state and the impact on the county workforce is considered and monitored. Diverting funds away from the family when they may need these funds for food, clothing, shelter, associated with caring for the child while they're in care could be an issue as well. The majority of financial responsibility in the area of child well-being, including child protection and child welfare, is borne by counties and fulfilled by county levy, levy and property tax dollars. Continuing redirecting funding from the local level without examining the impact of the well being of children and families impact the work counties can do. Max remains committed to continuing to be engaged in conversations about this important issue and thanks to the committee for the time. Thank you, Mr. Vold. Members, questions for the bill author or testifiers? Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, to Representative Pinto, uh, as well as Mr. Jackson and Mr. Murphy, thank you for bringing this issue forward. Um, it certainly is commendable that the perseverance and endurance of, of both Mr. Murphy and Mr. Jackson, your, your stories are heart-wrenching and uh, you stand, you know, stand as a symbol of uh, perseverance and, as I said, endurance at great odds to yourself. Uh, Representative Pinto, you and I spoke about this yesterday, and I, I I wanted to raise some of those concerns before the committee, uh, and I'll revert revert back to uh, uh, put it in context. You know, when you establish a trust, and a trust, the trust arrangement was actually uh, part of the Crusades. Uh, 
where the knights, when they went off um, on, on a crusade, they would trust someone to take care of their belongings, their land, their possessions. And that comes with a very heavy burden uh, as the trustee of, of those belongings, because you do affirm your fiduciary responsibility uh, to preserve those assets and uh, be accountable uh, for anything that occurs to them uh, upon the return of the owner. And so as I look at this bill, uh, one of the first uh, issues that I would raise uh, as a concern uh, for this is you are placing uh, the, the burden of being a fiduciary on someone uh, and that whether that be DHS or someone that they delegate that to uh, going forward. Um, and with that, you also then in our subdivision eight under disbursements identify a specific amount that would be dispersed to the beneficiary every year of $10,000. The problem that I see with that is that you are guaranteeing an amount based upon a risk reward uh, ratio that I think is untenable for a fiduciary to commit to, uh, particularly if the funds are minimal over the a period of time What's to say that you only have a very few years uh, of, of uh, opportunity for that investment to grow? Uh, you're suggesting that it would be $10,000 per year uh, until it is depleted. The problem is with a risk and a reward, if the reward is not met and it's, it's a loss, you might end up with uh, no money in that account based upon policy. So I, I would tread lightly on that section. I think there are certainly other means rather than placing uh, these monies in trust. Um, I, I have become familiar with Maryland, uh, having accomplished a similar goal as we've heard described in this committee. Uh, but I understand that there are measures underway in Congress to undo that. Um, there has been some litigation brought forward uh, by the Supreme Court uh, affirming actually these type of arrangements, but I think the litigation itself is troublesome in terms of the parameters that we're setting up. Um, the question I guess for uh, you, uh, Representative Pinto, is if this is a problem, which we recognize that it is, why wouldn't you just prohibit counties from collecting these funds and instead requiring it to go to the children right away um, through some type of uh, guardianship uh, arrangement, which would be more uh, straightforward without uh, entangling it in the bureaucracy of DHS. Chair Pinto. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Albright, and, and a big thanks to you for the, we did a quick check-in yesterday, and uh, getting the benefit of your expertise on this is great, and I'm, I'm thinking it'll happen now and then, and then after this hearing, too. Um, a couple things. Um, uh, I think there is maybe is some cleanup in line 3.24 that you've pointed out um, the because it says disperse 10,000 per year to confirm the idea is to dispense uh, up to $10,000 per year. Uh, if there's more than $10,000, then it's $10,000 in this year and then there are, and then, you know, additional amounts after that. And I think that that's a, probably a good technical fix. But to confirm, it's not a requirement that there be $10,000. If there's fewer than $10,000, then you can't obviously disperse $10,000. So I think that's a good point and maybe just a misunderstanding uh, that we'll want to make sure to clean up, but that's the that's the expectation there. Um, uh, I will note that uh, you know, you've got a challenge, and maybe I'll turn to, um, to Mr. Murphy in just a second on this, but um, you know, if you, obviously, if you give money to somebody before they're 18, let's say a child is, you know, nine, we don't want that child handling the money themselves. If you give it to a guardian, well, now who's the guardian? What's the responsibility of the guardian? I mean, so somebody has to take responsibility at some point. And the question is, who is that? Um, and I think I'd certainly be open to, to, to other thoughts, but I'll just note, if you identify a guardian, now suddenly that person is taking on a fiduciary responsibility. So at some point, somebody has to say, um, we are going to take responsibility for this. I'm not sure Mr. Murphy may have a thought regarding the guardian versus trust point, but that's kind of my overall thought on that, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair Pinto. And members, we have to kind of wrap this up in the next okay. uh, seven minutes or so. So Representative Albright. Madam Chair, I, I, I want to continue to work with Representative Pinto on this. I think it's a, it's, it certainly is a venerable uh, approach uh, to an issue that has been 
adequately vetted by both Mr. Murphy, Murphy and Mr. Jackson by their own testimony. So I'll leave it at that and look forward to following up with Mr. Pin, uh, Representative Pinto offline. Thank you, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Chair Pinto, for this um, idea. And and thank you especially to your testifiers who were really um, compelling and uh, brave. And you know, I, I very much look forward to seeing what you both uh, continue to do in your lives. I I know you will find great success. Um, but uh, Chair Pinto, to the like how the bill is working, I was concerned to see that that. Children as young as 14 could get these funds. And I, you know, I, I would just like you to speak to why you think that's necessary or even a good idea. I mean, we've had lots of discussion in this committee about whether people's brain development is good at 18 or 21 or even 25. And it concerns me somewhat that children as young as 14 would have access to this money and, and could honestly be really taken advantage of. Um, if people know they have a lot of money. So um, I would just like you to speak to that. Thank you. Chair Pinto. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Robbins. Um, well, I think you're referring to the provision starting at 3.28 of the bill. And that says that it, that would be only on a petition to a court. And the court would then order um, to, it could be to pay for the beneficiary, but it says to expend for the beneficiary's benefit. And my thinking there is, you know, and again, any of us think about when you were the age, age of 14. Um, there may be costs that happen with, you know, you want to play hockey. Um, perhaps there's a school that it makes sense to go to. Uh, you know, uh, there's there is expenditures. If you think about the money that I guess if I think about the funds my parents expended on me between the ages of 14 and 18, in some cases that was going to be substantially more than when I was younger because there are opportunities and things coming up. But that is only if a court receives a petition and orders that and the court then takes that very seriously but remember we're talking about a situation where you've got potentially some money building up there and a, a child a teenager who's trying to take advantage of opportunities and cannot access those funds and we don't want to just give the child the funds but having a process where it goes through uh, through a court etc um, only makes sense to me so i hope that that's reassuring to you um, those checks but to have a child simply wait and not get access at all of that money even with a court review that doesn't make any sense to me either Thank you, Chair Pinto. I'll go to Chair Liebling next, but in your answer to Chair Liebling, could you also address what other states are doing? Are other states setting up trusts or retaining the money for county um, services and foster care families? Chair Liebling. Yeah, thank you. And I, I wasn't really gonna ask a question, but I really just had to say thank you to the testifiers. And I texted Chair Pinto and told him, I'm just like crying. I This is like, thank you for telling us that this is happening because we did not know. And Mr. Jackson, you said something about not having much of a voice. You have a huge voice. And thank you very much for bringing it to us and Mr. Murphy. I mean, we have a huge budget surplus and we have people saying, give it back, give it back. We have no needs or, or just give it back. Well, I, the way I'm viewing this is this money belongs to the children. And I know there are technical things to work out, Representative Pinto and others. I know it's it's not a simple matter, and I, I'm so grateful to you for working on it. But fundamentally, to me, this money should belong to the children. There's another, there is another bill moving that is similar in that it talks about how we uh, bill families after foster care is over. We go and put these huge bills on families. And of course, this is very closely related. Uh, you know, not that people shouldn't pay for foster care, but they should only pay if they can and if it doesn't impact their well being and futures. And clearly, we need to fix this. And if we needed to appropriate money to do it, I'm all in for that. If we need to shift money off of the counties to do it, I'm all in for that. And if, and I would also like to see us, frankly, be retroactive and reimburse some of the children from whom this money was taken. So that's just my feeling. And I, I just so appreciate that this bill is here today. And thank you so much, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Chair Liebling. And we'll be hearing that bill next with uh, Chair Moran. Chair Pinto, final comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll address the point you raised too. Um, I want to note that um, unfortunately, uh, AJ and Mr. Jackson is no longer on uh, with us because he's, I think, has to test. <laughs> he has to take him. He's, he's a high school student who's working so incredibly hard. 
Um, Madam Chair, to your question, um, my understanding is that unfortunately this is a practice that has been pretty widespread around the country and there is now a strong movement to end it, recognizing the injustice we've recognized today. So Maryland was the first in the country to do this. There's a number of states that have legislation moving and sadly there's some litigation in some states um, recognizing the unfairness of this. Um, members, uh, it's what was occurring to me as we were just talking today that uh, what's really going on right now is that we are charging children um, for their own foster care. Um, we can't do that with many children. Uh, they, they don't have jobs, <laughs> they're, they're kids, but it happens that with some kids because their parents died, they have uh, the social security funds and those are their money that we're taking. Um, and so I guess, again, to be really candid with folks, um, there's some technical issues to work out, um, and I guess I'm sending this message to the hardworking and just terrific people at the counties and with DHS, who I know have been looking at this. Um, let's really work in the next couple of weeks to make sure that we can can fix this. I'm going to draw on the expertise um, and uh, just terrific intentions of Representative Albright, and let's see what we can figure out to actually make this happen, because there is no reason that we should continue this practice. Um, Madam Chair, thank you so much, and members, and, and certainly to our incredible testifiers and for all their hard work. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Pinto. Yes, let's figure out how to how to how to make this bill, um, how to implement this bill. So, with that, members, House File thirty two eleven as amended will be laid over for possible inclusion in our Human Services Omnibus Bill. Okay, members, we may we do have permission to go over time, so we may have to extend this committee hearing for another ten minutes or so to hear the last bill. So, the last bill we have on our agenda is House File thirty six fifteen. Chair Moran, welcome to Human Services. Um, it looks like you have a DE1 amendment. Would you like to adopt the amendment and then explain your bill? Uh, yes, uh, Chair Schultz, I would okay. like to adopt the DE1 amendment. Okay, I'll move the DE1 amendment. Member, this is a members, this is a voice vote. Please unmute yourself. All those in favor of adopting the DE1 amendment to House File 3615, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion prevails and the DE1 amendment is adopted. And member, members, uh, the motion is to lay over 3615 as amended for possible inclusion in our human services omnibus bill. Chair Moran, um, to your bill as amended. Well, good morning, uh, Schultz and uh, committee members. I want to thank you for the opportunity to come to come before you to present um, House File 3615. Uh, first, the DE1 amendment prohibits the practice of charging families for out-of-home placement, except in appropriate situation required by federal law. So that is the uh, amendment. Um, so the out-of-home placement policies at the state level works against families reunification, and it keeps families in a cycle of debt and poverty. We know from studies in Minnesota and other states that counties and the state spend significant resources to collect payment. And oftentimes the expenses exceed the revenue received by county and state. We also know that out of home placement policies are delaying our goal of reunited families when possible. That's why I've introduced House File 3615. Uh, Chair, Madam Chair, I have two testifiers here today who are, are planning to speak to this bill, and so I would pass it on to them. Sure. Thank you, Chair Moran. So the first testifier I have listed is Trish Scophammer from the Ramsey County Attorney's Office. Yes, good morning. Um, good morning. And Please state your name and affiliation and then proceed with your testimony and welcome to committee. Yes. Hi, I'm Trish Scopehammer, and I am with the Ramsey County Attorney's Office. I'm the director of the Child Support Services Division. Um, let me start off by saying that Minnesota law requires that families re help to reimburse the cost of their child's out-of-home placement. There's, there's not any um, wiggle room in there. It's a shell. Um, it requires that we uh, look to the families and also to the assets of the children, as, as the previous bill was, was discussing. And we are required then to look to their ability to pay. So there's already some ability to pay in there uh, using the child support guidelines, for example, or some other guidelines. Child support guidelines are frequently used. Um, and then those funds are, are, are used to reimburse the cost of, of uh, the foster care placement. Um, a lot of this uh, collection comes through the child support system. And as we know, the child support system can often be punitive. 
for families that don't have the ability to pay. And so families get caught up in some of the collection efforts that we use in child support cases where it may be really appropriate when we're trying to get money from one uh, parent to another for the purpose of raising a child. But it also happens to families when we're trying to get money from one parent to an agency. Um, and so it's problematic in that way. Other ways that, that these funds are collected are through what we may consider parental fees, and that would include sending invoices to parents, redirecting social security benefits, um, and doing uh, intercepts of state tax returns. We know that many, many of the families that experience um, foster care placement are low income. Uh, we've got some data that shows us that 80% um, of the families involved in out-of-home placement had incomes of less than $10,000 a year. So we're really looking at some of the lowest income families in our state. Uh, we know just by definition that if their families are experience, experiencing foster care, that their family's in crisis. Um, we know that this practice is not cost-effective, at least on the child support end of it, that we are spending large amounts of money to administer a program and collecting probably about 30 cents for every dollar that we spend to administer the, the process to get these collections. And we also know that it doesn't align with the values um, and the goals of trying to reunify families because families who are required to um, work their, their reunification plan so that they can get their children home often have to rectify situations that require money. And that may be something to do with housing, something to do with childcare. Um, and so keeping money in households would certainly help them to be able to comply with that reunification plan and get their, care, their kids back in, in their home as, as quickly as possible. Um, so uh, I do have uh, just a couple other little things I want to mention. One is that there is a federal requirement for foster care placements that are funded with federal dollars that when appropriate cases are referred to the child support system to redirect or assign child support. Um, and that uh, is a slice, a, a fairly large slice of the foster care cases, but certainly not all of them. And it's important to, re to uh, recognize as well that our Minnesota law requires not just uh, what we would consider typical foster care where children are involved in child protection situations, but also in situations where children are removed from the home and placed in, in settings um, based on a, a delinquency. And so we are uh, charging parents also for the cost of, of their children being placed in correctional types of of um, settings. So a lot of concerns here on the federal level. There's been some federal le legislation that was introduced a couple of years ago. We're not sure uh, where that's going right now, but at some point that federal law may change. So what we've done is, is come up with uh, some ways to um, have the state law in Minnesota be um, uh, permissive where we are only trying to reimb get reimbursement when the federal law requires that we do so. And that would be when it's appropriate in those limited cases where there is a federal funding. And the appropriateness would have us looking at things like the unification, the reunification plan. Um, is this gonna be create a hardship where uh, we might maybe interfering with that reunification plan? So we would have the option to not collect in those situations or if it's a short-term placement or when there is an adoption pending. So there would be circumstances where we would not pursue those collections even in the federally funded situations. And um, we would be able to then, you know, of course, uh, apply some filters in terms of what parents can really afford. So our concerns here, of course, are, you know, that we're funding government services on the backs of some of the most vulnerable families in, in, in our state and um, hoping that we can make a change to that practice. I have with me today um, uh, Michelle Koppel, who has experienced this, so I, I want her to tell her story. And just before she begins to speak, I want to mention that I've talked about low-income families quite a bit, that, you know, that we're really looking at some of the, the most uh, low-income families with incomes under $10,000 a year. But it's also affecting our middle-income families in, in some situations, causing a lot of hardship, even for people who do have jobs and who, who do have um, some earnings. And so I want to make sure that Michelle has an opportunity to tell her story as well. Thank you, Ms. Skopammer. Ms. Koppel from Ramsey County, welcome to the committee. Please state your name, affiliation, and then proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, and to the committee for allowing me to speak today. I'm, my name is Michelle Keppel, and I'm an investigator with the Ramsey County Attorney's Office Child Support Enforcement Division. And I am here, however, though, to speak about my own personal experience. April 29th, 2014, my son was the victim of a very traumatic event done on purpose maliciously by a person he loved and we trusted. Prior to this, he was a typical 14 year old that was obsessed with racing motocross, playing hockey, and was not prone to getting into trouble. 
after he changed almost overnight into an angry young man who hated the world and everything in it. He started getting into trouble immediately and very quickly spiraled out of control. At 16, he broke into a home with two other boys that included the boy that lived there. As a parent who believed in doing the right thing, I forced him to confess right away. The others did not, and ultimately, he was charged with first-degree burglary with extended juvenile jurisdiction, despite having no history of theft or any other serious charge. The first night he spent at Washington County Jail, we were given a financial information request form. We submitted the information as quickly as we could, because that's what you do. I was told based on our combined household income, we would be responsible for the entire bill for jail. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm a county employee. Ms. Koppel, you muted yourself by mistake. Sorry. I will back up. We submitted the information as quickly as we could because that's what you do. After several months of asking, I was told that based on our combined household income, we would be responsible for the entire bill for jail. Now, I'm an accounting employee. My husband was working for the federal government at the time. While we were financially comfortable, we certainly would not be considered wealthy. Very middle class. Eventually, we got an estimate of a nine-month sentence at the Eastern Regional Juvenile Detention Center, and it would be either, based on which program he went into, at $250 a day, which turns out to be for one month, $7,500 or $67,500 for nine months. The other program was 199 a day, and that is $5,970 a month or $53,730 for nine months. During my son's incarceration, we did have a drastic change in my husband's income. Initially, Washington County told us nothing would be done. Nothing would change. I knew I could request a hearing because of what I, the office I work in to dispute this. So Washington County eventually agreed to reevaluate our income. We ended up after all was said and done paying approximately $23,000. Through the sale of our home that we lived in for 12 years, we paid it off. Keep in mind, we were also on top of that paying astronomical attorney's fees, costs for treatment centers, numerous doctors and, and psychologists. Um, if I sat down to figure out the total cost that it, it, it was for all of this, I, I don't even think I want to know. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Koppel, and thank you for sharing what must be a very difficult um, story with us. Um, we hope you all the best and your son. So thank let's you. see, are there any questions from members for the chair or for Ms. Kopammer? Ms. Kopammer, sorry. I'm not seeing any questions. Any final comments, Chair Moran? Well, uh, again, um, for for the members around the, the breath of what is happening here. Um, we heard that the county is paying over $10 million to collect from individuals, often who are not able to pay, who are struggling rightfully to get reunited with their children. We heard about Ms. Copeland, who had to to sell her home. Um, and so my hope is that, you know, with a focus on reunification, keeping families healthy and strong and keeping them together, that we will remove this uh, must requirement for parents to use their resources associated with being removed from their home. Um, and so I ask for your support. I ask for the member's support. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Moran. I just want to thank all the testifiers we've had today and, and the members for bringing the testifiers to committee to share their stories so we better understand the situations and the um, importance of these bills. 
So with that, members, House File 3615 will be laid over, as amended, will be laid over for possible inclusion in our Human Services Omnibus Bill. Members, we have a full agenda the next two days in committee and then next week. Just leave it open. We may have to have a Friday hearing, but we will let you know via email, so watch your emails. And with that, members, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of your day.